Okay, thank you, Sylvain. So good morning, afternoon, or evening to everybody. So this is a talk about added bus, which is a concept uh, uh, um, uh, coming from the motion of uh, irrotational flows. Uh, because of the linearity of the Laplace equation, which governs the flow, there is a linear relation between the velocity potential and the velocity of a body moving uh, in the fluid. So uh, in essence, added mass represents the fact that when a body moves in a fluid, it must set the fluid into motion, which uh, imparts additional inertia to the body. And so when we the added mass is introduced based on the velocity potential, it appears in the pressure, uh, which is the product of the added mass with the acceleration of the body in the energy of the fluid, in the impulse uh, of the fluid, and also in the dipole strength of the body. So added mass is a concept which uh, um, concerns all aspects of the flow, the local dynamics of the body through the pressure, the distance dynamics of the remote fluid through the dipole strength, and the global dynamics uh, of the fluid as a whole uh, through energy and impulse. So uh, when the fluid can now support the propagation of waves, added mass becomes complex. It has a real part, which is uh, uh, proper inertia, and it gets an imaginary part, which represents the wave drag. So this is all for inviscid fluids. But now in viscous fluids, uh, when the Reynolds number is low, there is another kind of linearization, and the concept of added mass remains relevant. Uh, in this case, it is uh, superposed with Stokes drag and the uh, Bassett history force. So what I look at uh, today is how to generalize added mass to stratified fluids, which support the propagation of internal gravity waves. So we start from the linearized equations of motion of a fluid which is assumed uniformly stratified, the buoyancy frequency is constant and unbounded. And uh, we can uh, deduce from these equations of motion uh, wave propagation equation for internal waves, which is uh, similar to the Poincaré equations presented by Patrice Legal and Monde for rotating fluids. And uh, um, the, uh, the small amplitude, uh, velocity, pressure, and density disturbances can be related to an extension of the velocity potential, which I'll, I call the internal potential, and which, again, has been introduced for the first time, to my knowledge, for inertial waves by Sobolev in the 50s. And so uh, now the equations are still linear, so we can express the internal potential in terms of the velocity components of a moving body. This time, because everything is time dependent, uh, it's not simply a product, but a convolution integral over time. And so uh, we can generalize now the same ideas as before. I will go very fast on this because this is, uh, I prefer to concentrate on the applications today. So uh, the pressure forces uh, integrated over the surface of the body gives an hydrodynamic force, which is naturally related to the acceleration with added mass coefficients, which are defined here. Um, we can, uh, from the equations of motion, deduce an energy conservation equation, which identifies the, uh, which identifies an energy flux vector. And by integrating this energy flux over the surface of the body, we get the power output of the body, uh, which again can be expressed in terms of added mass coefficients and uh, velocity and acceleration of the body. Uh, we can do the same for impulse. So it's a bit of controversial topics because here uh, in what I um, Tell today there is no nonlinear effects, no wave action, but simply by taking the linear equations of motion, we can put them into a conservation equation, uh, which leads to identifying a momentum flux in terms of the internal potential. And by integrating this flux over the surface of the body, we get the total momentum output of the body. But this time, the definition of added mass is a bit different. Before, um, uh, okay, the, the time derivative and the buoyancy frequency uh, now uh, act on different components of the velocity. Uh, 
And we can also uh, relate the dipole strengths uh, to the added mass by derivating a Kirchhoff and Moltz type integral for the waves, uh, uh, expanding them at large distances to get dipole strengths. And again, the dipole strengths, as in a irrotational flow, is related to the mass of displaced fluid and the added mass of the body. So now we have two definitions of added mass. Uh, uh, which are more easily to see when we consider monochromatic oscillations of the body. And so the, uh, there is assuming that the body has enough symmetries uh, for the horizontal and vertical to be principal axes. The added mass components uh, for the two definitions are simply related to each other. We will consider the definition of added mass, which uh, uh, plays a role in the hydrodynamic force on the moving body and in the energy of the fluid, because these are the two quantities of practical interest. But we will use the other definition to determine the added mass. So how do we do this? Here I, um, using a paper I published uh, last year in GFM, uh, in which I uh, um, calculated, I mean, use the boundary integral method to calculate the representation of a moving uh, elliptic cylinder of spheroid, um, moving oscillating in a stratified fluid. And uh, by taking the representation of these oscillating bodies as sources of mass, and more precisely, the a spectrum of uh, these equivalent sources by expanding the spectrum at a small wave number, we get immediately the dipole strengths and from it the added mass components of the oscillating bodies. Here is uh, what this gives for the cylinder and the spheroid. So the added mass coefficients are the ratio of the added mass and the mass of the oscillating body. Here I use X for the horizontal motion and Z for vertical motion. And um, added mass for a cylinder, it's exactly as you expect physically. Uh, when we are below the buoyancy frequency, the waves are propagating and all the added mass uh, uh, gets into wave drag. Uh, which is only present for frequencies below the buoyancy frequency. There are no inertial effects. Conversely, for frequencies above the buoyancy frequency, when the waves are evanescent, there is no wave drag and just uh, additional inertia. Uh, now, when the, we move to 3D, and it's no longer a horizontal elliptic cylinder, but a spheroid, we get in the same way wave drag only for frequencies below the buoyancy frequency, uh, but uh, added mass becomes a, more, a bit more complicated. It uh, exhibits slightly different variations depending on the aspect ratio of the spheroid. And uh, what, uh, so um, one of the applications of added mass uh, is uh, the calculations of the radiated energy, which is especially important in the context of internal tides in the ocean, internal waves generating by the oscillation of the barotropic tide of a bottom topography. Uh, once you get the added mass coefficients uh, of the topography, if we can speak of this, we get immediately the radiated energy called the uh, conversion rate uh, for internal tides without having to calculate the details of the waves, the repartition into space at all. But today I will rather speak of the hydrodynamic force on the moving body. So, uh, okay, oh, I forgot this. It's a comparison, but uh, of the theoretical calculation of added mass with uh, experiment. Uh, it was done in a series of papers by Yevgeny Yermanyuk and uh, Nikolai Gavrilov, I think. Um, uh, they created a very ingenious and careful device for measuring the added mass of uh, horizontally oscillating body. They applied it to a cylinder, a sphere, a spheroid, and other body. Uh, a couple of years ago, the same uh, setup has been recreated at ENS Lyon, uh, where uh, Yevgeny was a visitor. Uh, uh, for some time and uh, did even better measurements. So we see there is a good agreement with experiment and theory with one uh, 
discrepancy, which is the fact that in addition to the wave drag, there is viscous drag. And uh, uh, the experiments showed that the, this attenuation uh, follows a uh, square root of the frequency law, which corresponds to the viscous drag on uh, oscillating bodies at large Stokes number. And it is in fact this drag, which uh, when Fourier inverted in time, gives the Basset history force in homogeneous fluids. So now in the same way, um, added mass, uh, its variation with frequency can be interpreted as a history force because it's a convolution integral. And um, so you just have to do a Fourier inversion. You isolate the high frequency variation which um, corresponds to the instantaneous irrotational response of the fluid. So it's the homogeneous added mass. And there is this additional history contribution created by internal waves. And uh, for the cylinder, the calculations are fairly easy. And uh, contrary to what we expect, the history force uh, is not at all like the Basset history force. It does not exhibit a peak uh, at, uh, the, at the origin corresponding to wh what just happened during the motion of the particle and then decreases. Here, uh, it takes about half a period to reach a plateau. And then all uh, everything that happened uh, during the history of the particle at past times uh, um, takes a role in the future motion of the particle. So this is 2D. Uh, it's uh, mostly a 2D peculiarity. When we move on to 3D, so for the spheroid, for horizontal motion and vertical motion, the integral, the ex analytical expressions are not very nice, but uh, it's essentially a decrease in times of the kernel of the history integral as uh, the minus three halves power of time with an additional, uh, with superposed oscillations and a uniform uh, decrease superposed on these oscillations. The decrease being especially strong for small aspect ratio, which corresponds to oscillating bodies which are horizontally flat. And then when the body becomes more streamlined, this uh, uniform decrease uh, vanishes. So uh, the application of, of this and of added mass uh, mostly is uh, with uh, naturally buoyant floats. It's floats uh, in the ocean, which uh, include a device um, manipulating the, their buoyancy by uh, expanding or contracting a gas. And so uh, this device is launched from the surface. Uh, 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 it uh, goes down to its neutral buoyancy level uh, following a, a square, uh, square drag law during this time. And then it starts, it overshoots the, the neutral buoyancy level a bit, and then it uh, goes back to it. And the, the, this uh, buoyant float so uh, adjust their um, buoyancy so as to lock to a given isopic null and follow it. So uh, what's shown in this slide is a very early design of the float. It has uh, evolved a lot in times, becomes much smaller. It's all integrated. Uh, there have been additional developments such like here, this kind of wing to stabilize the float. And um, uh, one of the specialists of this is Eric Dassaro, who has published a review chapter in a book uh, three or four years ago. I don't know whether he's with here already. It's early for him, but okay. So uh, we can, uh, the equation of motion of, okay, I'm close to the end. Uh, the equation of motion of the float includes the hydrostatic force, uh, the normal buoyancy, this uh, added mass force corresponding to the pressure. And based on it, we can calculate the, Fourier transform immediately express the Fourier transforms of the oscillations of a, of a body in terms of the, the variations in frequency of its added mass and then invert it. And the, the pioneer in this has been uh, Larsen 
1969, we published a paper uh, in deep sea research about the buoyancy oscillations of a sphere, which was slightly displaced from its buoyancy level then released. And uh, this paper has been seminal. Uh, it launched a whole branch of investigations um, by showing the roles uh, that could play uh, wave drag into uh, uh, stabilizing uh, a, a body close to its neutral buoyancy level. So the parameters, the relevant parameters are the, um, the what I call the Coyle and Carpeter number, it's the initial displacement. Uh, uh, com uh, divided by the size of the body and the Stokes number, which is assumed infinite so far. And so, uh, okay, I, I will just now calculate the real, uh, show the result of this compared with the experiments of Larsen. So the Stokes numbers were large and the Coilegan Campenter number relatively small. And there is a good agreement, except when the amplitude of oscillation becomes larger and the viscosity becomes also larger. Uh, there is a corpus of results on this uh, done in Yuli Chasheshkin's group in Moscow, spread among several publications, but looking at uh, a smaller strokes number and larger Coilegan Carpenter numbers. And um, okay, I will skip all the details, but uh, we can use um, uh, the known, known results about the uh, the, viscous, the, the viscous drugs in uh, homogeneous fluids uh, for oscillations at high Stokes number. The experiments of Yevgeny Yermanyuk showed that the drug obeys this law. So we use a rule in the books by Bachelor on low leaf sheets, how to calculate the coefficients for spheroids. And uh, the analytics are awful. In, I mean, it's, it's me saying this. This is the kind of expressions we have to deal with which just shows that, uh, except in the simplest cases, things have to be done numerically. And uh, uh, this, uh, we show that the addition of viscosity um, for this uh, square root of the frequency law uh, gives in a number of cases, for example, here, quite a close agreement with the experiment. So it seems to explain what we saw. But now I will move on to the last point, which is, um, Okay, I won't, don't, won't have much time to talk about this, but uh, Patrice Legald uh, published a paper earlier this year when he done experiments with a Cartesian diver, or called a Ludion in French, um, which is uh, very similar to naturally buoyant floats, except it, it, it is not active, it is purely passive. It's a hollow cylinder, which is open at one end and put in a, a fluid upside down. So there is gas inside which contracts or expands uh, in uh, response to variations of the hydrostatic pressure. So Patrice puts a, a Cartesian diver inside a stratified tank and uh, oscillated a piston at the surface of the tank to uh, vary the hydrostatic pressure periodically and the Cartesian driver responded to this. And here is the uh, uh, measurements by Patrice of the resonance curve of this diver. And uh, uh, in, in uh, blue, it's uh, the result of the, my previous calculations in the uh, inviscid case. So we see that the resistance is uh, very largely uh, uh, overestimated. It's uh, the same calculation using a value for the co dumping coefficient given by Patrice based on the experiment uh, in uh, maroon, in brown here, and in green, the same calculations done uh, using my uh, calculations with a, a drag as the square root of the frequency. And so we see that uh, Patrice's uh, um, use of a constant dumping coefficients gives much better results, which probably is due to the fact that the Stokes number in his experiments are fairly small, about 60. Uh, and so the, the, the drag is actually uh, constant in this case. It's a, a linear drag law in terms of the velocity. So just to, uh, to finish maybe, uh, what I, People who are familiar with the topic will notice that I have completely ignored rotational degrees of freedom. It was just to uh, put forward the basic ideas. Uh, in fact, they have to do to be taken into account, especially for bodies which are not a sphere or a circular cylinder. 
but it's not at all uh, um, sure this can be done in a stratified body uh, given the geometry, uh, given the, the, the non-isotropy of the medium. Uh, there has been a thesis by Eric Erlen, a student of Stefan Levin in Smith in 2007 about uh, this kind of motion and this could only be done for a cylinder for 2D situations. Uh, a second remark is that uh, by using a viscous drag for homogeneous fluid, it was really just to get an idea, but we should use instead a proper uh, theory of the boundary layer, such as that published by uh, Stéphane Le Dizès and Michael Levas a couple of years ago. And also, I have uh, this is at large Stokes number. There are a number of investigations about what happened that very for in Stokes flow with stratification and. Um, I have not started to look at their investigations, but it should they should be taken into account to see the relation. I'll stop here. Sorry for the time. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, yes, uh, we have spent 20 minutes. We have time for a very short question, if someone has a, a very short question. So it can be either on the chat, or you can switch on your microphone. Yeah, this is uh, Patrice. You can hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for your talk. Just a, a small question. When you compare my data to your calculation, uh, you use, uh, you use uh, the coefficients that you calculated for a sphere? No, 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 no. I use uh, uh, in your paper, you took my coefficients for the sphere and you added uh, some terms to make okay. it fit the experiments. Here, I tried to use the coefficients for the spheroid. I used a, tr uh, a trick which I found in the literature of, uh, about added mass, telling that for an elongated body, you can use the added mass for a spheroid having the same actual length and taking the transverse radius to conserve the volume. Yeah, this is a bit surprising because uh, we may discuss that afterwards, but I will come back to you uh, on this point, okay? Because it will be too technical to, to, to talk like that. Thank, thank you, Bruno. Okay, so thank you, Bruno, again, and we'll move to the next talk.